morning, everyone. It's uh, lovely to see you uh, on this Sunday morning. Uh, it was bright and cheerful early this morning, um, but it's still pretty cold out there. Um, but um, it's, it's great to know that we're, we're turning that corner, aren't we? It's, it's slowly getting towards that springtime. I don't know about you, but the snowdrops look absolutely beautiful. Um, and we've just got in our garden, we've just got the, the daffodils just starting to poke up as well. And you think, yeah, life is just starting to come back uh, this springtime. It's absolutely wonderful. I've um, got a number of notices, I'm afraid, uh, to mention, so uh, please bear with us. Um, tomorrow, Monday evening, we've got our Monday night uh, youth group starting again after the half term. Um, please remember that we've got a pancake special. Many will know that we sent out a number of invitations around the different schools and things like that, so do pray that uh, we'll have a, a large number of children come along um, and that we can have some great fun, um, not just eating pancakes, but I'm told we've got pancake games as well. Um, so next week if you come and there's bits of pancakes stuck on the ceiling, you know, be careful where you sit, they might fall on your head afterwards. Um, so do remember Monday night youth group, um, those that are awake early, 7am tomorrow in the morning we have our Zoom prayer meeting, um, it's exactly the same link as previous Mondays, uh, so do come along to that if you can do a meet with us for prayer just for half an hour at the beginning of the working week. Um, on Tuesday it's a safeguarding meeting starting promptly at 6.30 um, here in the chapel. If you want food before that, uh, then we're meeting here at 5 o'clock for food. But if you do want to have some food and you haven't said anything to Sharon, please do say so uh, for that. So that's 6.30 start, 5 o'clock for food on Tuesday. Wednesday, Wednesday's going to be a great evening. Wednesday, you can come along on Wednesday evening. We've got a time with the Cape and Ray students um, and we're going to have a praise session, worship session, prayer and testimony and things like that. It's going to be a really nice evening. We've looked at some of the hymns and some great hymns to sing uh, as well as they're going to tell some of their testimonies for these young people who are going to Bible college, um, working out what God wants to do in their lives. So it's going to be a fantastic time uh, to spend time with them. Again, that's at 7.30 as normal. Um, 6.30 if you want food, there'll be a meal at 6.30. Um, and if you could see Charlotte or Gaynor, yeah, if you want to come along for food from that, that must be today. They must know today um, so that they can get prepared uh, whether you want food. 6.30 on Wednesday, 7.30 for the start of the meeting. Friday... Um, ladies' night, us guys had a night out last night. Um, it was a good night together uh, that we had. So, ladies, it's your turn on Friday night um, here at the church at 7 pm. Uh, and you're doing some quite beautiful looking key rings um, to make as well. So, uh, do see uh, Carla or Sharon or anybody else that does the ladies' night for more details over that. And lastly, I didn't forget this because I've been told three times now to say this. So, Kay, I am saying it right now. If you're into knitting, um, then we're desperate to get some knitted squares made. Uh, they're going to go out to Turkey. Strips. Strips. I've been told squares. That's your fault. So strips, some knitted strips made. Um, they're going out to Turkey and to Syria uh, to help in the situation there. If you've never done knitting before, and hands up on that one, that's me, um, then there's loads of stuff that Rachel's put out the back. Uh, do have a chat with her as well. They're hoping to actually set up an evening when you can learn how to knit um, and the productive knitting that you've done will go to Syria and Turkey in the situation there. Um, Mike, great to see you here. Mike Meller from Bournemouth is coming to minister this morning and this evening to us as well. And I think that's everything. I'm all right in saying that's everything. Oh, go on, Gaina, one more. There is a ladies' breakfast on Saturday the 11th of March. Right. That's surely Okay, that's on the 11th of March. That's the 11th of March at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, ladies' breakfast. Okay, so maybe we'll have to try and work out, do a men's fry-up as well or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember that um, as well. I think that's everything. Great. Well, let's just pray then before we start our service together. Father, it looks like it's going to be a busy week for us as a church this week. Many different things uh, going on, many different activities taking place. But Father, even though there is much going on, we pray now that as we just come to you, you will quieten our hearts. Um, that we will, in some ways, forget all the notices that have been said and just concentrate on you. Um, and then we'll be reminded of what needs to be done in the week later on. So, oh, Father, help us now, we pray, just to sort of quieten our hearts, to remember what a great God we've come to worship this morning, what a wonderful Saviour we come to worship. Father, help us this morning as we do that, because we ask it in your name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, Christian was said something in his sermon about graveyards and he used to go walking around and this reading what's on the the grave tombs and it made me think what would be on our grave stone what would be our etifaf if you think at the, at the end of everything what would it be hebrews 11 gives us a little bit of an idea of some of the things 
that people said of other people. So we have, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. By faith, Noah was warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place to receive as an inheritance. By faith, Sarah received herself power to conceive, even though she was past childbearing age. By faith, Abraham was tested to offer up Isaac. By faith, Isaac evoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after it had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Wellington Chapel. By faith, you. By faith, I. What would be said about us to say what type of person we were? What type of Christian faith did we have? What type of impact did we have on the people around us? It's a huge challenge to think, what are we doing here to the glory of God? And how will that be remembered for his glory? That's picked up on our first hymn this morning. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design, in those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith we see the hand of God.
So over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about the memory verse on the top here. And no kids, I'm really sorry, I haven't got any chocolate, so don't think about coming up uh, and saying the verse and getting some chocolate. But, but, there is a mistake up there. And no, it's not that one that had one Peter and it was changed to two Peter a few weeks ago. There is a word missing. There's a word missing. That's got everybody thinking, haven't they? What word could possibly be missing? Anybody got any ideas? Go on. No, not amen. That's a good word to use, but no, it's not amen. No. Think of the opposite end of the verse. No, similar, but not quite. No, similar to and. But, Michael, it's a good job you're here still, isn't it? But, the word but is missing. And that's hugely important in some ways. Yes, as it stands as itself, it is absolutely true. We want to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we want to do that. But that is a key word, but. There's loads of buts in the Bible. In the youth group, we went through a series called But God. So it was events that happened and it said, but God. And then the result of that was something totally different to what was there before. And this is saying that, yes, we should grow in the grace and knowledge. But the word but tells us that something happened before. There was some reason why that was said. And it was the fact that a lot of false teaching was going on and, and different things were told to the people there. They said, but you, you people, you grow in the grace of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So when we think about this verse, we think not just of the fact of what it says there, but what's our lives like? Sometimes we're pounded with things that come to us. Things at school, college, at work, things that the world throw at us. And it wants to infiltrate our minds and tell us things that maybe aren't quite true. But the Bible says, but you, but you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So next time Christian comes up here, now hopefully he's not going to listen to this beforehand, when you come up here and say the verse, you can say, but, at the beginning and challenge him why you said that word, but, at the beginning. Great verse. Let's pray and thank God for his word. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for every single phrase and, and word and verse and chapter that it contains. We know that absolutely every part of it is inspired for you, by you and is useful for our teaching, training and rebuking and correcting in righteousness. Father, your word is so precious, so important and that is why we value it so dearly in this place. So, Father, as we read it personally, as we ponder upon it, as we meet together as a group of your people and it is ministered to us, help us to understand the value of your word. But it does remind us that in this world of ours are people who would desperately love to have a whole copy, desperate even to have just one of the Testaments, or desperate to have a gospel, desperate to have just a few verses. And yet they're so scared they hide copies because they're afraid of what would happen if we had got caught out. So, Father, they memorise it. They have it embedded in their brains and in their hearts so that they can recall it at any time. Father, we pray that you'll help us to do the same, to memorise your word, to understand your word, to value your word, to understand how precious your word is, so that we would indeed grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ in everything that we do, in everything that we say. Help us in this, we pray, because we ask it in your name. Amen. Well, after this next hymn, the children are going to go out to Sunday school and Anna's going to take them out upstairs to Sunday school. Um, but we've got a great hymn to sing next. It's a lovely hymn. I'll find it on my piece of paper. Uh, Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. And we'll stand and sing this song and then afterwards the children will go out to their classes.
in a moment. We're going to uh, look at the reading, but um, let's just pray for the children as, as they go out now to their Sunday school. Father, we thank you for the young people that we have here in this church, each of them so incredibly special to you, valued by us. So, Father, as they listen to the stories in your word, as they do activities based on those stories, Father, we pray that your word may penetrate their hearts, that even though they are young and their, their minds are still developing, their minds will be full of Christ. Father, we know that in schools and, and other establishments, they will be told things which are contrary to your word. So, Father, we pray that in this place, as we teach them the truth, as we teach them things based upon your word, that that way cancel out anything that the world teaches them, and they may think upon you as the true message. So, Father, be with them, be with those that teach as well, that you will bless all abundantly, because we ask it in and through your name. Amen. Genesis 24 um, is what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 to 4, uh, 10 to 28, and 57 to 67. So we'll be jumping a little bit because this is a, quite a long chapter. Genesis 24, we'll start at verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who was in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may take, make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Moving on to verse 10. Then a servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Naor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of the evening, when the time the women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of this city are coming out to draw water. Let the young women to whom I shall say, please, let down your jar that I may drink, and whom shall say, drink, and I will give water for your camels. Let her be the one who you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, Behold Rebekah, who was born to Bethel, the son of Malchai, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, give a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar from her head and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew water for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighing half a shekel, and two bracelets for her arm, weighing ten shekels, ten gold shekels, and said, Please, tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethel, the son of Malachi, who bore to Nahor. She said, We have plenty of both straw and fodder, and the room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord, and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me this way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother, household, all these things. Moving on to verse 57. They said, Let us call the young woman and ask her, 
And when they called Rebecca she, and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca, her sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands and may your offspring possess the gates of those who hate him. Then Rebecca and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servants took Rebecca and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahari and was dwelling in Negeb. And Isaac went out to mediate in the field towards the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. When she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camels and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and uncovered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought into the tent of Sarah his mother and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Amazing chapter um, of love and passion there. I'm going to ask Mike if he'll just come up. I've got a few questions that um, I'd like to ask him. Um, I've known Mike for, for a number of years, and just grab one of the mics over there if you want, Mike. <coughs> and... Um, but I'm sure that sort of many of you uh, probably don't know who this character is. Who is this person with a boot on his foot limping away? Um, so, Mike, you've, um, you're an author, uh, preacher, evangelist, do lots of open-air work. Um, but that's not the Mike right at the very beginning of your time uh, on this, uh, this earth. So you're a newspaper man to start with. How did that come about and, and what happened during those years of your life? Yeah, um, I guess... When you're in those school years and you've got to try and um, figure out what's going to happen next, you know, most young people I speak to, they say, I haven't got a clue, and that was certainly me. And um, I guess looking back, you can see key events. I, I learned to play the trombone at school. That was going to feature later on. <laughs> and then um, a friend of mine left school and wanted to work on a, a newspaper. And I was leaving, and as I say, didn't have a clue what I was going to do. And he said, Mike, there's a job going on the Bournemouth Echo, if you fancy it, as an office boy. So I had nothing else to do. Mm. So I started at the Bournemouth Echo, just uh, uh, as, as an office boy. And I did quite well and um, got promoted and uh, got a very good job. But meanwhile, I started to work um, in bands and getting paid to play trombone. So um, these sort of two career paths developed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I guess were... were factors in, in me drinking heavily, can't put it all on them of course, but um, I started to gravitate towards um, heavy drinkers both in the newspaper world and then in the music business I was getting more deeply into and uh, and despite now, you know, as the years went on, I had a wife and, and children, um, but the drink began to take over and I found myself drinking more and more and uh, and then I often say that I never knew when I crossed the line from becoming a heavy drinker to an alcoholic, but I certainly did. So by my mid-twenties now, I'm, I'm an alcoholic and um, getting worse as the years were going by, getting deep into trouble. And, uh, but it, again, I'm trying to brush this on. Mm. So I'm 31 now and uh, now I'm going to die. I think I'd come to terms with that. I'm either going to drink myself to death or I was always having car crashes. So I'll, I'll either die <laughs> one way or another. And how has that affected your family? Oh, well, I drove my wife around the bend, you know, <laughs> poor woman. Yeah. And, uh, and it wasn't because I didn't love my kids and, and my wife. It was just that um, this thing grips you. If you know anyone who is an addict, um, it just overrules everything. Mm. And you can't break free. And so I, I love the flavor of drink. I love being drunk. I love being with hooligan drinkers. So for you to say to me, change, mm. I say, well, how and why? And you know, and even my wife said, Mike, why don't you go to Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, well, they'll tell me to stop drinking, won't they? She said, well, yes. I said, well, you know. Why would I bother going? <laughs> not, not possible. Yeah. Um, so that was it. And, uh, but uh, something did happen. Well, on the newspaper place. was a young man who was a Christian, yeah. and it, it, there was this desk slotted in right at the side of mine, where this young guy came to to work, 
And um, so bit by bit, I heard about Jesus Christ. Mm. And I just thought, well, good for you, mate, you know. Um, but as I say, time, time is going by and my, my, my life is getting worse. And uh, already lost my license for drunken driving and got it back again. And I thought, well, I better shape up now. But no, you know, weeks went by. I'm back in the same situation, a paralytic falling to the car day by day or night by night. Um, but the day came, and I'm speeding this up a bit, when um, he turned and said to me, you know, Mike, you can't carry on like this, can you? Mm. Very brave thing to say. And I said, well, no, you know, not expecting to have an answer. Mm. And he asked me, Mike, do you believe there's a God? And I said, possibly, I never ruled it out, but how can you know? And do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I said, well, possibly there might have been someone, but I just couldn't see the relevance. And but then he said, why don't you ask God to forgive your sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and change you? Mm -hmm. Never heard that before, but there was something stirring inside. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, I went out of the room that day and uh, I went to a little toilet cubicle, got down on my knees, prayed the worst prayer ever. You know, God, mm -hmm. if you're there, help. You know. <laughs> Came out and uh, it was the end of the day and I hadn't, I hadn't told him I prayed, but I got into my car, drove home and just you know, broke down in tears of joy and uh, I knew it was all true. Mm. I knew there was a God, I knew that he loved me, I knew Jesus died for me and I remember thinking if I crash the car and die now, I'm going to heaven. Mm. And uh, the hardest part was getting home trying to explain to my wife, you know, <laughs> so I got home and uh, I said, Gwen, I've become a Christian. She said, oh no, <laughs> you know, what's he up to now? And uh, Anyway, so that was three months of intense battle mm. where, where um, she she hated me being an alcoholic, but she couldn't understand what this religious stuff was. She was terrified, really. And uh, But three months later, you know, God worked in her life. She began to read the gospel, and she was converted to. Mm. So that was a long time ago. It was over 40 years ago. Yeah. But Jesus is alive. There's nothing greater than, than living for him. And uh, nothing else would have done it. I, I needed a change from inside out. Mm. And what I was longing for without realizing it was to know God. And uh, the maker of the universe came to live in me. Tremendous thing. Mm. And so from that day on, I could do nothing but speak about Jesus. And that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> and you obviously got a great passion for over, um, over outside work and, and evangelism and well, things like it, that. Well, if it's true, then, then others need to know. Well, you know if, 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 if God loved a rotten person like me, mm. if there's a heaven, if there's a hell, if everyone's going to one of those two places, and I know those things, mm. it's just a natural... Uh, yeah overflow is it of a life mm. and uh, so we you know if we're Christians we've got the greatest news we're living in a, a world full of fear and despair mm. and hopelessness and we've got the answer mm. so how can we keep quiet yeah. about that yeah so if there's a couple of things that we could pray for for you for you and your family what would they be uh, um, this first time? Of all, apart from your foot my obviously. poor wife's <laughs> having to do all the driving <laughs> <laughs> but but really um Yes, I mean, you've been saying about it, you know, by faith, Mark, and I think the thing is, it's a, mm. it's a walk of faith to the very end, so just mm. keeping going. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing, nothing greater for Christians, we just need to finish well. Mm. So pray that for me, uh, for my family, and... Um, all your family Christians? Well, all four have, have believed and be baptised, but yeah. I think I share one of them particular struggles. Mm. Uh, it's a tough old world, isn't it? And... Um, and nothing, you know, as a dad, we want nothing greater than our kids to know Jesus and to live for him. Yeah. And so pray for, for my wife, Gwen, for me, my yep. family. And, uh, and just the, the utmost joy of, of uh, serving Christ, but it's a battle, so I'm preaching. So I, so I preach in different places uh, Sundays. And then when I don't have a boot on my foot, <laughs> uh, I go to open air and yeah. do that. So thank you. Right. Let's just pray for, for you, Mike, and um, for us as well. Father, it is true that we have an incredible gospel message. The gospel message that saved Saul on that road is the same God who can change people now. Nothing has changed. You are the same yesterday, today and forever. And it's wonderful to hear a story about how you have taken a man and, and a man who has a rotten and, and difficult situation and turned that completely around. Father, it, it brings joy to our hearts knowing that you are the, still the same God who can change. So Father, with that encouragement we would pray for Mike as he continues to serve you um, both in in church environments and in outside preaching as well that you will bless him abundantly keep him safe when he 
is doing these things, we pray, and, and maybe he will have the joy of seeing people changed uh, as he preaches the gospel to many a people. Pray for his family as well, that you will be with them, those that are hurting and, and struggling, Father, we pray that you will get alongside them in such a personal way that they'll be assured of your love for them uh, and your care for them. For us as well, Father, the, the challenge to make sure that we, we spread this amazing gospel to those that we know, Father, those that we love and care for, if we truly love and care for these people, Father, then we would not want anyone to go to hell. So, Father, give us that urgency, we pray, to spread this amazing gospel message, that souls will be saved, um, and that you will have all the glory to your name, as we ask it in and through Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Well, before Mike comes up and to minister God's word to us, we're going to sing our next song, What Love, My God, Would Bring You Down to Earth. What king would take a low and lowly birth, yet to this dark and broken place you came to sleep beneath the stars that you have made. And then that amazing verse 3, what love, my God, could hold you to a tree to bear that overwhelming debt for me. The Son of Heaven leaves the Father's side. The healer believes the life he made to die. O oh, love, my God, like a flood. Let's stand and sing together.
Well, uh, marvellous hymn, isn't it? Uh, revealing something of, uh, of God's love for people like us. And uh, there's nothing in the world so, uh, so beautiful um, or, or, or powerful or magnetic uh, as love, uh, wherever it's seen. It is this uh, powerful, powerful thing that um, disarms us and changes us and, uh, and of course, being made in the image of God, it's um, one of the ways that we're to reflect God's character. Um, that short statement that we find in 1 John, God is love. Incredible um, three words, aren't they? Uh, not that God has love, but God is love. Whatever else we say about God, uh, and that's a lot, of course, we could say, but God is, is love. And so we, one way we can reflect something of his character is to love, and those are the first two commandments, to, to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, mind, and, and then to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. So love, it, it is foundational, and we can't function w- without it. And what we're going to look at today, for a little while, is um, three great love stories. Um, if you've been to a wedding, everyone loves a wedding, and you sit there and uh, the heart's melted, and uh, so love stories are, are tremendous, and certainly if we look at the Bible, there are a number of them. But um, we're going to have a look at one love story that's just ending, and then we'll see one is just beginning, and then the third one is one which is unique uh, and is um, eternal and unbreakable. But first of all, and uh, just a little bit back from where Mark read, And in Genesis chapter 23, this is the love story that's just ending. It's the love between Abraham and Sarah. Um, Abraham, of course, the great patriarch, (coughs) the great Old Testament patriarch. And uh, and the Bible says that all all true believers are children of Abraham. So he is this important um, Old Testament figure, this great patriarch, Abraham and his wife, Sarah. But in um, Genesis 23, we come to the very end of Sarah's life. Maybe I'll just read those couple of verses. Genesis 23, verse 1 and 2. Um, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So this chapter um, in Genesis, it it opens with Abraham weeping at the grave of his beloved wife, Sarah. Uh, And although uh, Genesis, it records the main trials and triumphs of uh, of Abraham's life, um, there are many years of of blessing that, that go unrecorded. We're just given that which we need to know. And uh, so there is much unrecorded of this relationship. She dies at 127. That's a good old age. Of course, we look back earlier in Genesis, we can see that the the span was uh, 800, 900 years. In those earlier years when when the genes were pure, but time goes by and the the, um, the age span gets uh, lower and lower. But 127 is still pretty high. They would have celebrated their 100th wedding anniversary. Anyone had a recent anniversary? Cause for celebration, isn't it? But no one's going to have a hundred. Um, we've gone over half that, Gwen and me, by God's grace. <laughs> but a uh, but hundred, that is something else. A century, now if you're married, you'll appreciate this, but a century of walking together as husband and wife through all the ups and the downs and the joys uh, and the sorrows the bitter disappointments as well as all the, the happiness and the blessing, those are the varied experiences of, of married life. But as I say, most of those scenes are hidden from us, but it is no wonder that we, we see a broken-hearted man here at the death of his wife. And no doubt at that time his mind just goes back over all those years and you know, straight back to the Mesopotamia where he met this 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 young woman, and they fell in love, and so the mind is going back over all those things, little flashbacks uh, uh, along the way. And um, 
And among those thoughts, no doubt, would have been that long wait for Isaac. There is this child of promise that God promises will come. But that long delay and the ups and downs of, of that episode. But eventually God keeps his word, of course, and Isaac is born, who we'll be looking at in a moment. And, uh, well, no, no, no doubt other memories too. Uh, painful memories, uh, shameful memories. Abraham was a sinful man, like, like all of us. And uh, no marriage is perfect. No marriage is without struggles. And um, inevitable. You get two sinful people trying to live as one. That doesn't get ironed out overnight. In fact, it doesn't get ironed out, folks, to be honest, does it? You know, you've got these two people, different mindsets, different aims and ideas, and you can say, right, now live as one. You know, um, it's tragic in our day. People give up much too soon, don't they? You know, old people will tell you, we just got on with it. We had our disagreements. We just got on with it. It's too easy to, to bail out, isn't it, and to give up. You know, love perseveres through all those things. And uh, the grass is always greener on the other side. And we're seeing these serial mistakes. The couple's breaking up. Another partner. Another partner. And the tragedy and then the, the heartache of, of the children caught up in all that. So we're, we're seeing the disintegration of family life. Because people just bail out much too quickly. There are struggles. And of course Abraham and Sarah, two sinners, put together kept together by God's grace, but, you know, you have to work at any marriage, and they were no exception. And so, um, this is a time of grief. This man is, is, is grieving, and that's one of the experiences of life, of course, isn't it? Grief. The writer uh, of Ecclesiastes says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to, to dance. So such are the varied experiences of, of life, but there is a time to, to grieve, uh, to, to, to mourn. It was our dear queen uh, who said quite recently before she died that grief is the price you pay for love. That was true. Uh, a good word of wisdom there. Grief is the price you pay for, for love. It would have been strange, wouldn't it? Um, it would have been improper if Abraham, uh, at the death of his wife, had just carried on. And you hear that phrase today, well, we'll just move on, you know. Some, some neighbours of ours, you don't know who they are, miles away, but, uh, you know, after bringing up the kids, all, all the years of all the struggles, and the kids are grown now, and they're lovely kids, and uh, for some trivial reason, uh, the marriage has ended, you know, and, and you hear that phrase, well, we, we just moved on, just move on, that's it. All those years of struggle, you know, you, you do that together, you build a home and, uh, and a family, and, and then you move on. Well, it, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Tragic. And, uh, and so, here's Abraham, and he's rightfully grieving. And, you know, again, you look in our culture today, we need to look at our culture. We don't know how to grieve. You notice when someone dies, whether it's a public figure, or whether it's someone, we, we just don't know, we're embarrassed by death. Because we've, we've pushed God out now. We don't know how to grieve. It, it's gone. And uh, even the word death is new. People, no one dies anymore. They pass. Have you noticed that? They've passed. Oh, don't mention the D word. They've passed. No, no, they're, they're dead. That person is dead. How do you cope with death? Now, Christians face death head on. We, we're, not a, we're not embarrassed to speak about death because we know the answer. We know that Jesus Christ has come and dealt with death. Christ came into the world to deal with our great problems of sin and death. So Christians, we've sorted that one. Now, we're not blasé about it. We're not arrogant about it. But we know that death will come. Every one of us here today, we're going to die. You're going to have a death. And we don't know when it is, folks, do we? This is why we need to do right with God today. 
Because the one great certainty is you will die. The people that we're depressing, we go, well, it's going to get worse because it's a judgment. It's appointed to every one of us to die, then to face judgment. Folks, that's every one of us here today. So we don't dodge these issues. Uh, maybe, perhaps I could ask you this morning, have you faced up to that? Are you ready to die? I'm not being gloom. I ask it loving. Are you ready to die? Are you ready to meet with God? So important. Nothing more important. And as Christians then, we, we, we know that grief is important because God says life is precious. When that life goes, it's sorrow. It's significant. The shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. But why? Because a friend died. <laughs> and what it amazes me about that is even Jesus, Jesus knowing he was going to raise his friend from the death, from the grave, he, even then, he weeps. So, so awful is death. Such an awful thing. And, and, and God, the heart of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus wept. Death is awful. So this is a scene of grief where there is true love. Then there is grief. And if you don't grieve over someone you love dying, there's something wrong with that. So there is a time to mourn. And, and again, the, our tragic culture, you know, you, uh, the, the, the funeral homes will tell us, what's, what's the top song that's played at a, a funeral service? I did it my way. Followed closely by the ridiculous Monty Python song, Look on the Bright Side of Life. What does that say about our culture? That we make life and death trivial. When God says, no, life is precious uh, and death is, is awful. So if there's no recognition that we're made in the image of God, we don't know how to cope with, with, with death. So as Christians, we, you know, we, <laughs> we're not immune to the sorrow of, of, of death because, because Christians grieve. And yet we don't grieve. I mean, Paul in Thessalonians, maybe we'll just turn quickly to, to one Thessalonians. Here's the Apostle Paul. And um, he's giving encouragement here in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. The context is, is in the fact that Christ is coming again, the one who is alive. But he says to those who are grieving, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So in other words, what's he saying? Well, believers grieve. <laughs> as Christians, we too grieve. We don't say, well, whatever. We, no, we believe in heaven. No, we have Christians grieve. Someone you love dies and your heart is, is, is broken. We, we, bereavement is the greatest of all traumas, of course, isn't it? In fact, that word bereavement, it means literally to tear away, to tear away. Um, as somebody once said that um, when you lose someone you love it's like an amputation um, you learn to live with the loss but you're never quite the same again and most of us here if not all of us have known someone we love who has died and there is that tearing away that separation so Abraham's love for his wife it didn't end with her death he still loved her so he felt the grief when she was gone but Christians do not grieve as those who have no hope that's what Paul is saying here because we know that Jesus has died and, and, and risen part of my job over the years uh, in, in being a pastor and uh, I don't know how many funeral services maybe the most <laughs> depressing situations is to be on a, a, a Welsh hillside on a Monday and the, the rain is coming down and the wind is blowing and you're lowering someone's remains into the ground. That is reality, isn't it? So the awfulness of death. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And it's been such a, a privilege to see how Christians cope with that. Because we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus died and rose again. 
Well, anyway, the second love story is just beginning. And that's in Genesis 24. And, um, and what you love about Genesis 24 in, in this love story here is um, the way that we notice God's hand upon all the details. So here's Abraham. This is his son, Isaac. He's grown now. And um, he's burdened. He doesn't want his son to marry a Canaanite woman, someone who's outside of the faith. That would be an unequal yoke. So he sends his chief servant back to the family home in Mesopotamia. Now that's about 500 miles. It's a long trip, you know, and uh, no cars, no, no quick transport there. But he sets off with 10 camels laden with gifts. And the servant is a godly man, and he's sensitive to God's guidance. And uh, full of faith, he arrives after that long trip um, outside the town at a, a well, uh, verses 12 to 15. Maybe I'll just read those verses again. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be, now this is a bold prayer, now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let me draw, uh, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So the servant, as I say, praying that prayer of faith. And this young woman comes along. Now it's the Holy Spirit who's behind this, drawing these, these things together, this remarkable meeting. So he's at the right place, at the right time, meeting the right person. God has to be in this. It's such an important thing. He needs to get it right. Um, he's going to have to ask this young woman to leave everything that she knows and come back with this stranger to marry this man she's never met. So that's a big ask, isn't it? And so what the servant does, a very wise man, he observes the character of this young woman. Uh, verse 21. And the man wondering at her remains silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So after giving the servant a, a drink, this young woman uh, goes back to the well to draw water for the camels. Now bearing in mind that apparently a camel could drink 21 gallons, and we're told in verse 20 that she drew enough for all the camels. Boy, that's some hard graft, isn't it? And, uh, and little did this young woman know the blessing that would follow this one um, humble act of kindness. The Lord Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. So when we're faithful in small things, we can be trusted with larger things. Again, without being sort of a, an, old, an old grump, you know, people want instant success now, don't they? Whereas, no, hang on, there's, there's a way that you start, you start humbly being faithful in small things. You prove yourself in small things and then things uh, can be entrusted, greater things can be entrusted to you. And certainly God wants to see, can you do a small thing well? You know, where there's no glory in it, where there's just that humble act of, of service. A man called Samuel Marsden, he said, make every occasion a great occasion, because you can never tell when someone might be taking your measure for a larger place, or in other words, a larger opportunity. So do small things faithfully, do them, do them well. But of course, all this is building up to the big question. Abraham's servant um, is taken home to meet uh, Rebecca's family, but it's all leading up to this big question, will you, will you come and uh, be the, the bride of this man? So he goes back to the home, family home, of course, Abraham's uh, relatives, and no doubt it's full of chatter, and how is he getting on? How is Abraham? And no emails, no texting, no, it's uh, before social media. So they're, they're, they're keen to hear how he's getting on. But, uh, but the servant has only one thing in his mind. He's got to bring this bride back. All moving very fast. So when we come to verse 
50 here. Laban and Bethuel, that's uh, Rebecca's uh, brother and, and father. They said, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebecca. Before you, take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. So, um, it's all been leading up then to that big decision time. Rebecca has to make the biggest choice of her life. And will she go and be the bride of this man she's never met? Can she trust God in this? And so when we come to verse 57 and 58, we know the answer, of course. So they said, um, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So, great, great love story. We'll, we'll see how it, it ends in a, in a moment. Um, but really what we're saying, you see, is that these two love stories and others like it, in fact, every love story in one sense, is pointing to the greatest love story of all. That is Jesus Christ and his bride. Uh, an amazing picture we're told of the relationship between Jesus and, and his bride his followers, his, his believers. Um, in fact, when we look at these stories in Genesis, we might ask, well, why is, the, why is the longest chapter in Genesis, that's chapter 24, why is the longest chapter in Genesis devoted to a man finding his wife? It's because there's more than meets the eye here. There's the gospel in this. In fact, Jesus himself said he's in all the scriptures. Remember on the Emmaus Road, after the Lord had risen, and there were those two downcast disciples. The Lord gives them a, a, a Bible study. Yeah. And um, he says, beginning with Moses, we're, we're told, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So we see the gospel in Genesis so plainly here. In Genesis 22, if you know the, the book of Genesis, Abraham is called to sacrifice his son. That awful time when God says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, and he has to go up that, that lonely journey up onto the hill. And of course, God keeps him from actually going through with the act. God spared Abraham's son, but God did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all. We were singing, singing earlier the, the wonder of that. And, and if we're Christians, we, we believe that, don't we? That, that God sent his only son to die in our place. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I find myself sometimes heartlessly singing these great hymns and songs. And if there's a danger, that the longer we've been on the Christian road, the danger is we just take it for granted that Jesus Christ died, that God sent his son. And, and I, I have to rebuke myself time and time again, and, and certainly when I'm preaching, and, 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 and I'm fearful, I, I, pray. I have to pray, God, please, when I'm speaking about Jesus Christ dying on the cross, please why not just see this as another point. And, and I have to ask myself, well, I, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died for me, but, but can I really understand that, that God sent his beloved son and had him nailed on a tree? I mean, be, before that, the brutality that, that God puts his son through, the, the whipping, the scourging, the, um, the, the insults, the, the humiliation, to, to have his son dying naked on a tree, and then for God the Father to actually pour out his anger on him, I mean, I mean, what a spectacle that is when we see Jesus, the most beautiful person ever to have walked this earth, God in a body. We see him nailed to a tree. And then God's anger, you know, that God, God's, God's anger against sin is poured out fully on him. Now, in my mind, can, how, can, how can I get, you know, you've heard my story, rotten Mike Meller. Forget anybody else. How on earth 
Can, can God who loves his son pour out his wrath upon that son whom he loves instead of me? It doesn't make sense. And so when I'm doubted to when I'm tempted to doubt God's love, I have to remind myself, what do we see on the cross? Two things. God's hatred for sin and God's love for rotten sinners like me. Incredible. So do I believe the cross? Of course. Do I understand it? Nope. Not at all. Will I ever understand it? I, I don't really know. But it's just, and this is what we see here, God's love for sinners. Even in, the, in these love stories here. Because the Bible speaks about the church as, as the bride of Christ. Uh, we get those lovely New Testament pictures of the church. It's a family, it, it's a body. But to emphasize the love relationship, it's Christ and his beloved bride. From heaven, he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her, and for her life, he died. What love is that? That Jesus Christ should love us in that way. And then in Ephesians, Paul, now if you've been to a wedding, very often that passage in Ephesians is read about Christ and his bride. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. And then we're told that he will one day present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You know, we, we need to have a high view of the Church of Christ. We, we, that's us, you know. <laughs> when people disrespect the Church, and even Christians, we, 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 we need to remind ourselves, we, we see all the wrinkles and the blemishes, but when Jesus looks at the Church, he loves the Church. We need to be so careful how we speak about Christ's bride. In my open air work, I, I, I meet people, and sometimes they, they say, well, I'm a Christian. I say, well, where do you, where, you know, where, where's your church? Oh, I don't bother. You know. And they'll give me a long list of reasons why they don't like this. I said, you know, are you telling me that you, you love Jesus, but you, you think his bride stinks, do you? This is the church of Jesus Christ. With all the blemishes and the blots, Jesus Christ loves his church. He loves us. He loves us as individual believers. He loves us collectively as his church. And, and that, that passage in Ephesians, you know, it's, it weaves in and out. You, you wonder, is God speaking about the church now or the bride? Because the two sort of weave in and out. It, it's a profound mystery, says Paul. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. And so here there's much more than an ancient love story. It's the bridegroom when, when, when the servant goes to get this bride. And we see this love story. It, it's a picture of the love that God has for his bride. He's going to get a, a bride for his, for his son. But let me just quickly come to a close here. Because um, well, let's just pick up those last verses in, in Genesis 24. Because we have the meeting when, when the two come together. They've never met each other. And um, in a sense, I, I guess there's even a picture here, isn't there, of, of the, the heavenly bridegroom, that, that Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to come and get his bride. All of, uh, we're getting near that day, folks, aren't we? You know, all the signs are here that Jesus is coming. As our world reels from one thing to another, all the signs are showing that the end is near and Christ is coming for his bride. And in Bible times, there was that period of betrothal. During that time of betrothal, and the, the bride and the groom were separated until the wedding. So at this moment, uh, the bride of Christ is separated, but eagerly awaiting for the bridegroom to, to come. But anyway, here's, here's the meeting now. End of Genesis 24. Um, what should we read? 20, verse 62, maybe, your place. Now Isaac came from the way of Beer Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. Now just picture this. He went out in the field in the evening and he lift, 
lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So it seems like there's love at sight. There's that lovely picture of the eyes lifting. He lifts his eyes. She lifts her eyes and their eyes meet. And that great love story uh, begins. Again, pointing to that greater love. And um, so wherever you see um, the, the, this beautiful relationship between a man and a woman on earth, and we have to say that, folks, in these days, Marriage is between a man and a woman. The Bible knows no other marriage. It is a man loving a woman for life. So um, whenever you see that, 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 that beautiful uh, union, it's the palest reflection on what is to come. A husband and wife are a reflection of Christ and his bride, the palest reflection. I, I've... Um, in my role as a pastor, uh, been humbled to see some beautiful demonstrations of this. In our church in Bridge End in South Wales, there was this lovely little couple. They were quirky, got to say that. I mean, some of us are quirky, aren't we, as Christians? You're looking at me as if you never met anyone. Oh, I know. I get it. But uh, they were Jack and Betty Richards, and they, they were ex-brethren, if you know the brethren. They were quite exclusive and a little bit... Um, I won't go, I'll have to draw the line there. Really. Yeah. We can say that. <laughs> they had their own. Jack, they, they're from London. And uh, Jack was a real cockney like that. But, it, but Betty still gave it to him nicely. So they were, they were quite a, a quirky mix themselves. And, and Jack looked a bit like Charlie Chaplin, a little chap. And he used to have a walking stick. He used to walk like this, to take the dog for a walk. Like. And, uh, and Betty would have a little sort of bun with a knitted bun at the back. And very, very sweet. And, uh, but anyway... Um, Elderly now, and uh, Betty uh, gets cancer, and uh, she's taken to hospital, and uh, it's only going to go one way, she, she, she's dying. And the routine would be that Jack would go in every evening with a little stick, and he'd sit down by her bedside, and he would read the scriptures to her, and he would take her hand and pray. That would be night after night, but it came to the end where she's unconscious, so she doesn't even know he's there any longer. But the same routine, Jack would read the scriptures, take her hand and, and pray. Now I was there one night, and he read the scriptures, and he took her hand, and he turned around to me and said, ain't she beautiful? Now, I looked and saw an elderly, withered, dying old lady. Jack didn't. Jack saw his bride there. Beautiful, you see. That's how Christ sees his bride. He doesn't see the wrinkles and the blemishes and the faults. Beautiful, that's his word, folks. Jesus Christ is coming for his bride. There should be great anticipation, great rejoicing. Oh, folks, we're going to the wedding supper of the Lamb, Christians. If you don't have that hope, the word that Jesus says to you is, is I'm coming soon. But he says, come. Come. Be part of this. Don't be left out. If you doubt God's love for you, look at Christ on the cross. He loves you. He did this that you might be saved. Don't think that you're, I'll come when I'm polishing myself up a bit. No, no, come as you are. <coughs> you don't have to be an alcoholic. But you are sinful. But Christ died for Sinners. <laughs> so anyone can come. So why not come to him? Because the time is getting near. Well, let me pray. Father, we 
I certainly struggle to really comprehend that you could love me, that you could love us like this. Yeah, Lord, what do we know about your love? What, how can we understand it? Lord, our love is so imperfect. Maybe that's the trouble that we find it so hard to really love. We can't love unconditionally. Lord, we're, we're, we're fallen, flawed, <coughs> sinful people. But Holy Spirit, we pray that you might give us um, a love that's not our own, Lord. Um, a love that comes from heaven, living within us, that we might love you as we ought, that we might love others as we ought, that we might, we might love the unlovely as we ought. So, Lord, hear us, we pray, and uh, grant us a real understanding of Calvary love, because we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall you this thing? most well-known love hymns, love divine, or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown, Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love, thou art, visit us with thy salvation, enter enter trembling heart. Let's stand and sing this great hymn together. <laughs>
pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. Father, we know that day is coming. Your bride crowns are come, Lord Jesus. One day he will indeed come. Until that day, make us useful for you. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Tea and coffee.